of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, that beneath the, the, the cross is the skull of Adam, where the blood of Christ flowed from the cross and went upon the skull of Adam. What did it do? It revived the whole human race. The whole human race, again, was gifted with immortality by the blood of Christ. So we have the tree of life, which is the tree of the cross. We have Moses. Moses with his staff. Remember the staff that worked so many miracles. Not to speak of all the miracles of Moses, but what was the miracle when he crossed the Red Sea? You know the story. He made the sign of the cross with his rod, and the Red Sea's opened, the Israelites passed through. Safely, he went to the other side, made a sign of the cross with his staff again. <coughs> what happened? It fell upon Pharaoh and all his chariots. It was a type of uh, baptism, by the way, as also was the entrance of Joshua leading the Israelites across the Jordan River. Uh, again, we see opening the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of the sea. Again, an image of baptism there. In the hymnology, and there's many instances that speak about the cross. One is by the prophet David, extol the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. What is the footstool of Christ? It's the cross. Amalek. We know the story there, again in the Old Testament, where Moses is instructed to lift up his arms, and his arms being lifted up in prayer, that the Amalek, the enemies, that they would be defeated. And so Moses stood there with his arms uplifted, and the Israelites battled the enemy, and the enemy was defeated. But when the arms of Moses retired and they went down, then the Israelites were being defeated in the battle. And Aaron and Hur, his companions, had to hold up his arms so that uh, by the strength of them holding his arms up, the image of the cross, the Israelites would prevail. The water from the rock, remember that story. Again, the staff of Moses. They were in the wilderness. There was nothing to drink, and so Moses, with his staff, he hits the rock, and water comes forth from the rock. And as Paul writes in his epistles, that rock was Christ. The rod of Aaron, Aaron's rod, the rod, his staff, all of a sudden, they mystically burst it with flowers. Well, they don't burst forth from a, a sterile rod, but it did, showing that the cross was not sterile, but it achieved things for our salvation. When the Israelites marched in army, their formation, the divisions were set out in the sign of the cross. Part of the army in the front, some in the back, some in the left, some in the right, and that's how they marched in the sign of the cross. Jacob's blessing, when he blessed his uh, descendants, he blessed them in the sign of the cross upon their heads. The axe and the stick in the story of Elisha, they were chopping the trees down by the uh, Jordan River, and an axe fell into the river, and the man was distraught. He said to Elisha, he said, I only borrowed that axe, it's not mine, and now it's lost. And Elisha said, don't worry about it. And he took a branch and he threw it in the Jordan River and it, it sunk and attached itself to the axe and it floated up upon the waters and Elijah took it and gave it to the man. Signifying again that the cutting, the axe, that it cuts off sin as such. And it would again be the cross and the image of the cross. The waters of Mara. Well, again, the Israelites, they were in difficulty. <clears throat> they were came to a, a stream of, of Mara, and, and the waters were polluted. They couldn't drink the waters, and the people were going to die of thirst. And what does Moses do? He's instructed by God to do what? To throw a branch into the, the water, and the water became sweet, and it was the most delectable water that they had. And so all these are images, prefigurements of the cross. These are commented upon, upon the, by the fathers of the church, uh, even where it's not explicit, like the three use in the fiery furnace, and Daniel in the, the pit with the lion. St. Andrew of Crete writes, it says, it doesn't say anything about the cross, 
But clearly it was a cross because their arms were uplifted in prayer. Just like Jonah in the whale. His arms were uplifted in the whale. It's a sign of the resurrection, but it's also a sign of the crucifixion because Jonah is in the midst of death, obvious death, if you the belly of a whale. And yet, lifted up in his arms in prayer to the belly of the whale, he comes forth. He's uh, thrown out by, by the whale, and he's kind of resurrected, as it were, from uh, death. And so we have these images here. You can say, well, they're Old Testament images are very important. Do they speak to us today? Well, it's given to us to understand these things. That our Lord, before he ascended into heaven, before he uh, ascended, he gathered the disciples together and he said this. He said, these are the words I spoke to you while I was yet with you. That all things that pertain to me in the law of Moses, in the Psalms, in the scriptures must be fulfilled. And Luke goes on, he says, and he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And so it was given to them, what were the scriptures? Of course, it was the New Testament. The epistles weren't written, the gospel wasn't written. He was talking about the Old Testament. And so our Lord himself gave to his disciples after his death and resurrection, before his ascension, he gave them understanding of the salvific events of the cross. And what it accomplished, so that it would be impressed upon their mind and in their heart, that they would be motivated to follow the way of the cross. And that was important for the disciples of Christ then, and it's important for us disciples of Christ to this day. That it's imperative for us to know the scriptures, so that we understand salvific history, where it says in the Gospel of John, God so loved the world that it was from the very beginning when they were created. It was at the time when Adam and Eve fell, and the Messiah was promised, and Abraham was sent to the father of many nations, and the father of many nations is the descendant of Abraham, who is a God named Jesus Christ, that he is the king. He is the king that establishes not like David in Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem. <coughs> he is the suffering servant who takes upon himself the sins of the world. It's important for us to understand <coughs> the scriptures and to live in the context of the scriptures and to again be thankful for what we've received. That things weren't as they appeared perhaps to those outside the church. They thought, well, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified because the people went against him. And they weren't happy with him. But it wasn't that he was taken and seized. Rather, he gave up himself for the life of the world. But he gave himself up for the life of the world on the cross. And the cross defines who we are as Christians. The cross defines everything that we do. There is no ministry. There is no sacrament. There is no <clears throat> spiritual activity that is taken and assumed by the church which does not embrace the sign of the cross. Everything is by the cross. Water is blessed by the cross. Uh, uh, icons are blessed. Uh, we wear the cross. We believe in the cross. But it's not just to follow the cross and to know the redemptive act of our Lord on the cross, but it's also for us, also for us, as we heard in Paul's letter to the Galatians today, that I boast in nothing except the cross of Christ. This is our boast. This is what we glory in. Who would glory in a cross? It's a sign of death, humiliation, degradation. But our Lord changed that all around. It's a sign of victory, a sign of triumph. It's a sign of glory, that we honor the Holy Cross, that we glorify the Holy Cross, we wear the Holy Cross, we follow the Holy Cross. And as Paul goes on, he says, by the cross I am crucified to the world, I die to the world, to everything that is of this passing age. I'm crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to me. It's a spiritual death. And so as we prepare, hopefully we'll do everything we can to endeavor to be at the divine services. If we can't be for liturgy on September 14th, at least be madness on the evening before when we bring the Holy Cross out into the center of the church. And we'll hear the, that great canon that will speak of all these images that I just made very brief reference to here. So that we can understand how central the cross is to the Christian faith. How central the cross must be in our own personal lives. Let us be, as the Apostle Paul 
says, let us not boast in anything but in the cross of our Lord. In other words, Paul says this, that we preach Christ crucified. Christ crucified. This is what we preach. This is what we hold to. To our Christ be glory and honor for ages. Amen.